Hey everyone, and welcome to our final Lenten study on the Hebrew Bible. Um, last week we started on 2 Samuel, so we'll just go ahead and pick up right there. And in 2 Samuel chapters 5 through 10, uh, David, who is now king, moves the capital of Israel from Hebron to Jerusalem. And there he appoints two high priests in order to uh, appease uh, what had become competing priesthoods, two factions of priesthoods that he was seeking to sort of ease the tension uh, between the two. And then he also moves the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant is a very uh, important uh, piece to this whole story, because what does that carry? It carries the Ten Commandments, or at least the second version of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, so the Ark is a very sacred and holy relic that is important to Israel at this time. And as part of this move, David has a parade, and the parade is a lavish one. And David gets so overwhelmed with his dancing that he accidentally uh, exposes himself uh, to to the people, to uh, to his kingdom. And his wife, Michelle, is embarrassed by this and mockingly says um, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Uh, and then David gets real, speaking of royalty, um, <laughs> keep moving. Uh, David gets really angry with her um, with Michelle, and the story concludes with the notation that Michelle never had a kid as a result of this. And you can interpret that however you want. You can interpret it as David never slept with her again uh, because he was so upset uh, and angry with this comment that she made. Um, you could, some folks interpret it as God struck her barren for her, uh, for her one liner, which seems extreme. Uh, but however you want to interpret it, it says that Michelle never had, um, uh, uh ne never had kids as a result of her, uh, sort of mean comment to David, because as we know, uh, <laughs> uh, men are really sensitive and you have to be careful what you say around them, lest they never sleep with you again if you're partners. Um, at this time, David is living uh, in a palace, uh, but he has a desire to create a, a lavish temple for God. Um, but God, Yahweh, interestingly, refuses this gesture, uh, this gesture, gesture. Uh, maybe that works too, refuses this gesture. Uh, but God refuses this gesture. And God points out all of the blood that is on David's hands. And God says that all of this blood is too much blood to build a temple. So God tells David that God will build David a house in the form of a dynasty that will endure forever. And this is known as the Davidic covenant, the covenant with the house, the line of David. Now, that's interesting because God goes from telling David he's got too much blood on his hands to honor God. And yet uh, we turn around and uh, read that God is telling David that God will honor David, right? And so what we're probably seeing here, and I will point it out uh, at least one more time today, what we're seeing here is the competing ideologies of different writers as this narrative progressed throughout history. You have the voice from above. Remember we talked about that? The voice from above that tends to side with royalty. Okay, so the voice from above would be probably someone who is writing about God honoring David uh, in a metaphorical house in the form of a dynasty. And then you have the voice from below, probably more marginalized and oppressed individuals within the Jewish community who were writing as well, that probably pointed out, who that probably wrote about the blood that was on 
David's hands. So you have those competing ideologies at work uh, through the development of these narratives. So then in 2 Samuel chapters 11 through 12, we come to the somewhat famous story of David and Bathsheba. Um, and 2 Samuel begins with this wonderful line, and it's apropos of nothing as far as our lesson today. I just think it is an incredibly just cool line. I don't want to say beautiful because of the implication, but it is beautiful in some, some respect. But the line is this. It was spring when kings go out to war. Again, apropos of nothing, I just think that is a, a beautifully written line in the midst of what is an epic journey rivaling Game of Thrones, in my opinion, uh, of, of war and politicking and uh, sexuality and oppression and uh, justice. It's just, it's an incredible epic and it's beautifully written. And sometimes I think in people's haste to read these narratives uh, in the sense of what is God trying to tell me? I think sometimes people can miss just the simple joy of reading these narratives and how incredibly uh, entertaining and interesting and revealing they can be rather than trying to read it historically and just be like look how god moved through all this just reading it from a perspective of what an incredible tale okay off my soapbox um so even though it was spring when kings go out to war david however does not go to war but rather he sends his general joab without him. Now remember, David, David's reputation is of being sort of this incredible kingly warrior, right? But here, David does not go to war uh, with, his, uh, with his people. Would you please pick a lane? Thank you. Keep going. Thank you. Now, since David didn't go to war and probably a good chunk of the kingdom, at least the males in the kingdom did, uh, David has a lot of time on his hands. So he's, he's going for a walk and he's walking along his roof and he sees, he spots across the way on another roof, uh, another roof, Bathsheba bathing. And a lot of people always ask, why was Bathsheba bathing on the roof? Now, what I used to be taught, what used, what I used to hear from the pulpit, what I used to hear in Sunday school, and what I believed, right? Uh, because that's what I was being taught, was that uh, Bathsheba's motives here were impure. Bathsheba, knowing that she was in vicinity to... Uh, you know, the, the, the king's home, the king's establishment, that she was trying to catch the eye of David. Now, if you know how women tend to be treated and reflected within uh, ancient texts, not just biblical texts, but ancient texts uh, by and large, not all, but by and large, then this kind of jibes, right? Uh, that the, the woman was a gold digger, that she she needed someone to take care of her, and so she was looking out for the king, or that she was just a temptress, that she was a seductress, right? That's very common. But what I now know, and what you should know too, what you might already know, I don't know, is that Bathsheba was taking a ritual bath after menstruation. And this is important, not just because uh, to to not not just as a commentary on Bathsheba's motives within this narrative that she just wasn't a gold digger, that she just wasn't a temptress trying to lure innocent old David away. But rather, it's important to the larger story that is being told here because 
because she was taking a ritual bath after menstruation, it meant that at that moment, and this is important, Bathsheba was not pregnant. Okay? So the story progresses. David sees this woman, finds her incredibly attractive, finds out that this woman is named Bathsheba, that she is also the wife of Uriah, who is one of David's trusted soldiers. And because David is attracted to her, and as we've talked about, David really isn't that great of a guy, David summons for her and sleeps with her. Now, I think the power dynamics here are obvious, right? Again, if, 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 if we view this through the lens, uh, inaccurately through the lens of Bathsheba being a temptress, even if she was, let's say she was, the power dynamics are clear here. David is the king. David calls for Bathsheba. Bathsheba has no choice. She has no choice but to go to David and do what he wants, do what he asks. Now, Bathsheba was not a temptress, so that makes the power dynamics here even more disturbing, even more problematic, even more disgusting. Right? So Bathsheba soon sends a word uh, back to David after their copulation that she is now pregnant. It can't be Uriah's, right? Because again... She was taking a ritual bath for her menstruation on the roof the day or maybe the day after that David sent for her. And Uriah wasn't even home. Uriah was at war. So it's David's, right? So David summons Uriah back from the battlefield. And, you know, he makes some chit-chat, you know, uh, hey, how's it going? How's the war effort? Da, da 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 And then he says, you know, you've been working hard. Go home and wash your feet. Which, wash your feet is an ancient euphemism for sexual intercourse. And Uriah tells David that he can't do that. He can't go home and sleep with his wife while Israel and the Ark of the Covenant are on the battlefield. Uh, because sleeping with someone during wartime, uh, according to tradition, makes you ritually impure for battle. Now, again, we talk about um, the competing ideologies, the voice from above, the voice from, from below. This is actually a not too subtle dig at David here. The writers take a shot at David, and I think it's obvious. I'm sure you can spot it. David, the great warrior, was safe at home, sleeping with another man's wife and not in the midst of battle with his people. So he is, through the narrative, now viewed as um, impure. So David's now desperate. He gets Uriah drunk. Uh, and, and the reason he's getting him drunk is he's hoping that Uriah will sleep with his wife, but no dice. Uriah is, um, ironically, incredibly faithful to the king and the king's efforts. So David sends Uriah back to the battlefield. And he also sends word to Joab, his general, to put Uriah on the front lines and then order all the other soldiers to withdraw. And this, of course, would leave, since Uriah is not aware of these orders, this would leave Uriah exposed. And the plan works, and Uriah is killed. When Bathsheba finds out, she mourns her husband, and then David claims her as his wife. Now, David's trusted prophet, Nathan, after all this, comes to David and informs him of a great injustice that has occurred. And then he tells him a story about a rich man with a lot of sheep who killed the only single sheep of a poor man in order to feed a visitor. And David is outraged by this story. And he says that that rich man deserves death. He deserves to die. And Nathan points out that, David, you are in fact that rich man in the story. 
And Nathan also informs David that the sword will never leave David's house, meaning violence will be a part of, of David's legacy, of his house, of his empire. That someone will take David's wives and sleep with them in public. And that David's child with Bathsheba will die. Now, as we move into 2 Samuel chapters 13 to 21, uh, we now see that David's son, uh, Amnon, who, who, the, you know, he's the crown prince, right? He's the next in line. He rapes his half-sister Tamar with the help of his cousin. And David finds out about this and he does nothing to punish Amnon. So Tamar's full brother, Absalom, He's not going to put up with it. And he throws a party several years later. Uh, they say vengeance is a dish best served cold. Well, Absalom was very patient. Uh, this party occurred several years later, and he gets his vengeance on Amnon and murders him. And over time, again, we talk about the politicking and the game of thronesmanship that's kind of occurring within these stories. Over time, Absalom uh, steals the throne from David, his father, through shrewd politicking. So now dethroned, David flees Jerusalem. Absalom then proceeds to have sex with David's concubines on the palace roof, uh, fulfilling one of Nathan's prophecies and also as an act of, of uh, humiliating David. It's on the roof. Everyone can see it, right? And so this is a way of telling those who can see this happening that um, David's virility, uh, which makes a man, right? David's virility is now defeated as well, and not just David. It's sort of the ultimate humiliation for David. However, David takes the time to reconstitute his forces, and he in turn defeats Absalom, uh, his forces in battle, and then Absalom is killed by Joab, David's general. So we come to the end of 2 Samuel, and it closes out with David taking a census of Israel for the purpose of determining how many able-bodied soldiers were available for current wars and future wars. Israel was always at war. And God is upset by this. God is upset by the census uh, because um, it's a sign that David is not trusting God, is not trusting Yahweh for protection. And so God sends a, de uh, a deadly plague against Israel. And then David uh, realizes he has done wrong uh, by not trusting God, and he repents at the, at the conclusion. Now, interestingly... Again, we're talking multiple writers here. Second Samuel says that it was God who incited David to take a census, but doesn't say why. So God wants the census, then is angry about the census. So there's, you know, two competing uh, concepts here, two competing narratives of God here. And it's hard to believe, I know, God is never angry with Israel in the Hebrew Bible, right? But this is less an indicator of a two-faced God within the narrative. One who says, make that census happen, and then is angry that the census is happening. It's less about that kind of two-faced divinity. But it's actually evidence that these texts, again, were written and rewritten by different people with different agen agendas throughout the ages. Just as we see David portrayed as a righteous man, as well as a murderous monster, these are competing narratives from various writers. And these more problematic issues within the narrative, such as with David, uh, you know, they've either been ignored or reinterpreted by contemporary believers. For example, turning Bathsheba into a conniving temptress and not a victim. Um, because if you turn her into a conniving temptress, uh, then David's image of being a righteous man is preserved. 
Contemporary believers also like to point at the Psalms and the, the, the instances where David repents of, of his wrongdoing and, and, and sort of write it off as, well, he's forgiven. He's a man after God's own heart because he wrote these Psalms about longing for God. But you can't necessarily just wipe away within the narrative the genocide and the rape and I mean, any number of atrocities that David committed. Yes, he may be forgiven in the eyes of God for sure, but that doesn't take away from his real life monstrosities that today would would land someone in jail on the you know the death penalty perhaps, right? So you can't just take one without the other. You and vice versa, you also can't just take David as the monster and not take it in context with sort of the um uh, the, the, the more spiritual and forgiving aspects that scripture points to David as well. There needs to be a balance. We need to, and again, keep in mind that these are narratives. Not, there might have been a real David, but it's doubtful that uh, these particular stories were about, you know, a real David doing these things. It could have been a stand-in. It could have been someone else um, or a, a multiple uh, people that were just sort of... Um, I forget what they called it in, in movies when they bring like four or five character uh, uh, traits into one character to, uh, for the ease of storytelling. That could be the case as well. We don't know. But you have to take it as a whole. You just can't take the good David, right? And be like, oh, he's a man after God's own heart. You have to be realistic, right? And understand that he was uh, also... Um, a murderous monster, a tyrant in some respects. Also interesting about this census, not to get sidetracked, sorry, uh, is that in the New Testament, uh, so, you know, in, in the Hebrew Bible, it says that God ordered the census, but then God was angry about the census. And then in the New Testament, it says that Satan was the one who incited David to take the census. So there's even more discordance within the collective memory of these narratives. So it's it's oftentimes difficult to untie, but if we understand again that there were multiple writers writing throughout the ages, uh, rewriting these stories, it begins to make a little bit more sense. But no matter how one interprets these narratives, either way, by the end of what is called the Samuel saga, it becomes clear that the God of Israel is deeply tied into the uh, human character that is exemplified within the narratives. God sort of influence, influencing people, God speaking to God's people. So God is deeply tied into these human characters, but is also deeply upset by what these human characters do as well. Characters that both defy God as well as submit to God and characters that resist God as well as trust God. And so as we enter into the book the or the books of Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings, keep in mind what I keep saying as far as the interpretive lens through which we are viewing the Hebrew Bible. And I keep repeating this, and I don't think it can be repeated enough. What purports to be history, these narratives, what some people want to pass off as actual, provable history, these are actually acts of interpretive imagination, whereby the purpose of God, whether that purpose is judgment and grace, and sometimes those two things mixed in together, the purpose of God becomes defined in the life and the memory of the Jewish community. That is what these narratives are for. To ritually and liturgically and constantly remind the Jewish community that the purpose of God is judgment, that cycle of judgment and grace. Now, that said, 
many people view and there's as we as we begin moving along in history many people view first and second kings um main reason for existence again narratively but is to lay the groundwork for a theological explanation for the actual provable and historical destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. So what we now begin seeing as we move into 1st and 2nd Kings is a little bit of actual history intermingled with narrative. And that destruction of Jerusalem as become as it becomes clearer in Chronicles uh, it becomes a message for the Jews in exile to return to God and the Torah commandments as a way forward, a way forward to uh, healing and community and and rebuilding. So first and second Kings is very interesting in that sense of how we begin getting some, you know, uh, historical events tied into this narrative, you know, historical events that can be proved archaeologically and and through other texts outside of the Hebrew Bible. So in 1 Kings, uh, David is uh, now quite old. He's an old king, and he's incapable uh, because of his infirmities of fulfilling uh, his duties as king. And as a result of his age, uh, I don't know why I do this. I just like little things like this. Uh, in the King James Version of the Bible, uh, it says that David... Uh, he got no heat, <laughs> like G A T. He got no heat. I like that. It's um, it's probably as contemporary as the Bible is ever going to sound. Um, but a beautiful young woman named Abishag is brought in to lay down with David and to keep him warm. And while David is laying infirm and unable to make decisions, David's sons begin maneuvering to become king. It's a story as old as time, right? Uh, Bathsheba, still David's wife, she helps Solomon win the throne. Um, and the way she does it is, again, we talk about echoes and we talk about patterns. And we're going to see more of this with Elijah. But Bathsheba helps Solomon win the throne in a scene that's very reminiscent of Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, tricking Jacob's father, Isaac, into giving Jacob Isaac's blessing. So Bathsheba reminds a very feeble David of a promise that he had made to make Solomon king even though Adonijah was David's oldest son. But David made no such promise. So his mind is undoubtedly going here. But because Bathsheba told him this, this promise that was never made, David goes ahead and makes Solomon king uh, in order to keep that oath. And in some respect, even though it doesn't say this, I like to think this, this might even serve as a little revenge for Bathsheba, for David murdering her husband. Perhaps, you know, again, revenge is a, de uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. Maybe she waited this long uh, when she had the, the means to stick it to David. Uh, whether that was the case or not, she stuck it to David and she stuck it to uh, David's line, right? And so Solomon becomes king, and he goes on a bit of a killing spree to uh, secure his throne. Uh, and, and he kills David's general Joab, and he also kills his brother Odanijah, because you can't have the, the crown prince alive, um, you know, when you sort of stole the throne. You're always going to be looking over your shoulder, and you can't have David's chief general alive either because of his dedication to David. He would seek to uh, topple Solomon from the throne as well. So God approaches Solomon, and despite all this wrangling, this the murder that Solomon just committed in order to secure, to, to secure his throne— God uh, approaches Solomon and tells him that he can ask God for anything, kind of like a genie. And Solomon asks for wisdom. And this pleases God. And God, because 
Solomon's request probably came across as humble. God also gives Solomon, uh, even though he's already king, gives him uh, more wealth and power. So Solomon puts his new wisdom to work in the story that most everyone knows, whether they've ever read the story or not, the story of two women coming to Solomon with a dispute over a baby. Uh, one says it's their baby. The other says it's their baby. And Solomon says that, hey, I got a solution. I'm just going to use the sword. And I'm going to cut the baby in two and you each get a half. It's only fair, right? And one woman is fine with this. She's got no problem with the decision. Uh, the other woman is absolutely grief stricken. So Solomon, in his wisdom, decides that it is the grief stricken woman who is the true mother. So Solomon now spends the next 13 years building his palace, and seven years building a temple for God. God is apparently okay with Solomon building this temple. He has less blood on his hands than David did. And at this time, Solomon's wives number in the region of a thousand. And as a result of all these relationships he's got going on, um, he, and this is probably natural, he begins worshiping other gods, right? Uh, he's got wives that are also not Israelite wives, so they have other gods that they worship. And so Solomon takes part. Now, in today's culture, that's kind of cool. You meet someone, they have a, a different religion uh, than, you, than you do. You have an interfaith. Reza, Reza, uh, Reza Aslan and his wife uh, write about this a lot. He... Um, you know, he is Muslim. She is, uh, wait, is she Jewish or Christian? But there, I actually uh, honestly forget, sorry. But they're, they're two different uh, religions, and they write all the time about raising their uh, children in, a, in a, uh, a mixed religious household. And that's really cool, right? It kind of expands your horizons. And some days you, you can go to a, a temple with each other. Another day you can go to church. Uh, and it expands your education, your... Uh, multi-religious literacy. But obviously then, this was not cool. Um, but also at the same time, uh, Solomon is uh, oppressing his own people. Uh, and he's doing this through forced labor and tax increases. And this is particularly taking a toll on the northern tribes. Now remember last week we talked about how... Um, the, 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 when, when Israel was asking for a king, the, one of the messages was, or the implication was, you're going to get Pharaoh. You're going to end up right back in the situation that you came up, came out of, out of Egypt. And the description here of Solomon really sort of matches Pharaoh. He's oppressing people through forced labor, which is what Pharaoh did to the Hebrews and taxing them, uh, heavily. Uh, again, particularly in the northern tribes. So then Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam takes the throne. Rehoboam tells the northern tribes, again, that the, the northern tribes are the ones that were probably being hit hardest. He tells them, he doesn't tell them, oh, my dad was so bad, I'm going to take it easy on you. He says, yeah, my father was bad, but under me it's going to be worse. And so the northern tribes respond by seceding. They create their own liberty state, right? Uh, and this begins what is uh, historically called the period of the divided monarchy. And this occurs in between 928 BCE to uh, 721 BCE. So a couple hundred years. And so now the northern kingdom is known as Israel, and the southern kingdom is now known as Judah. Now, a few highlights of the divided kingdom. In 1 Kings uh, chapters 16 to 22, we read about how the 10th king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel, yes, Jezebel, her, uh, and that they're, you know, these are infamous characters in the Hebrew Bible, Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, primarily, uh, remember, they're, they're uh, 
you know, Israel, you know, kings of Israel, or he's the king of Israel, Ahab is. But one of the reasons that they're, they're sort of um, infamous within scripture is their worship of uh, non-Jewish gods. And they particularly worship Baal and Asherah. Um, and they were also pretty horrible to their kingdom, to their, to their subjects. Uh, Jezebel, for example, conspired to murder a man who um, owned a vineyard and her husband wanted the vineyard and he didn't want to give it up. So Jezebel conspired to murder him. Now, so you've got these two sort of, in a lot of ways, comic book villains, right? And so enters the hero, enters the prophet Elijah, whom God tells to confront the king over this crime, the crime in particular of the vineyard. Elijah tells Ahab that he and his wife uh, will both die because of what they've done. He's expressing remorse. He's sort of mortified once he sort of steps back and looks at what he's doing. And he says, in the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, so dog, and this is Elijah talking to Ahab. In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, so dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. And Elijah then challenges uh, the priests of Baal. And by proxy, he is challenging the king here. So, I mean, the king is worshiping Baal. Uh, so Elijah challenges the priests who are sort of the intermediaries uh, between the king and Baal. And so Elijah is directly challenging the king here. And he challenges these priests um, to a challenge of miracles. God versus God. And the God who can send lightning down from heaven to consume an animal sacrifice is the God that is worthy of Israel's worship. And interestingly here, this is, I mean, the, 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 the lightning aspect is not a mistake. Baal was the god of the storm. So this is similar, right, to how the Egyptian plagues from the Exodus narrative challenged the powers of the various Egyptian gods, right? Echoes, patterns. And of course, the prophets of Baal fail. We wouldn't expect anything less. Uh, Baal does not bring lightning down to uh, burn the sacrifice. But the God of Elijah does, Yahweh does, send fire from heaven, which consumes a sacrifice. And Elijah, after he wins, he's kind of a sore winner, ends up killing the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel then vows to kill Elijah, who despite the power of God that he displayed, runs away, flees for his life. And Elijah flees to Mount Sinai, where Moses met God, and the Israelites were given the Ten Commandments twice. And there Elijah is sustained for 40 days without food. And then God shows up and tells Elijah to name the prophet Elisha as his successor. And Elijah finds Elisha, and they cross the Jordan River together uh, after Elijah parts the waters. So I'm sure you're catching the recurring themes here, right? Elijah calls on God to display his power, just like Moses. He goes to Mount Sinai and meets God, just like Moses. And he parts the water, just like Moses. Again, recurring themes are extremely common within the Hebrew Bible because these narratives held liturgical, power and ritualistic power and the message to readers would have been clear as to how important Elijah was but not only how important Elijah was how important these other stories were too so the, the Exodus story the importance of that because if it's being repeated liturgically within these narratives if it's being repeated ritualistically within these narratives that's a signal to the reader ah these are important. I need to remember these and I need to celebrate these. So Elijah says goodbye to Elisha and a fiery chariot descends from the heavens and takes the prophet away, which is one of those biblical stories that you always see like on the UFO documentaries on History Channel and everything, like the artist renderings, a wheel within a wheel, 
Um, it's always, people always like, oh, it was the first UFO or something like that. But you always see those on the documentaries. And then in 720 BCE, the northern kingdom of Israel is conquered and exiled by the Assyrians. And because of the absence of any further narrative, because they've been exiled, uh, perhaps maybe even wiped out. Uh, so because of this absence of any further narrative about this portion of the Jewish population, uh, this group, uh, the Northern Kingdom, has become known as the 10 lost tribes of Israel. And you can see that in 2 Kings chapter 17. Which then brings us to King Josiah and his reforms in 2 Kings, and he's the king of Judea. But in 2 Kings chapter 22 to 23, uh, these reforms that King Josiah implements are very important. Uh, after hundreds of years of kings and rulers who turn from God, with some exceptions, Josiah discovers a scroll of the Law of Moses, which is actually the book of Deuteronomy. And seeing these writings down, or seeing these writings written down, it propels Josiah to make religious reforms within the kingdom of Judah. And because of these reforms, and some might even say reforms for the better, because he's using sort of the blueprint of the book of Deuteronomy, it is said that there was never a king like Josiah. But for some reason, we don't hear about Josiah that much, do we? We always hear about David or Solomon. But Josiah was a king, a king like any other, but we just rarely hear about him. But in 586 BCE, Josiah's kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, is also conquered and exiled. And this is done by the Babylonians. And this begins what is known as the exilic period. And we can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 25. Okay, so taken as a whole, if we read these narratives with any type of honesty or critical eye, these narratives within the Hebrew Bible, it does become clear, again, reading it honestly, not through the lens of perhaps evangelical interpretation or more conservative interpretation of these texts, if we just read them honestly, these narratives function clearly to delegitimize royal power. The kings are rarely good. The kings are rarely focused on the people. The kings tend to be abusive and focused on their own enrichment. And these writings, the way these are being written, is that, uh, you know, narrative from below. The narrative from below critiquing the narrative from above or the narrative of the privilege, the narrative that is seeking to uphold um, the monarchy. And ultimately, these narratives, these narratives from below, these narratives delegitimizing monarchy are meant to assert God, Yahweh, as the real giver of life, not kings. And that Yahweh should be Israel's one true leader. So these narratives are inherently subversive of royal power and would most likely have been read that way by the ancient Jewish peoples, especially those reading these narratives while in exile, right? Because their exile and trials occurred under royal rule and not under the auspices of the divine. Okay. That's probably long enough. Let me just get, uh, tell you a few things about Chronicles, and this will bring sort of a conclusion to, um, again, what is an epic story of the Jewish people. Two main things that you need to or that you should remember 
about First and Second Chronicles. Now, in Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 36, verses 22 to 23, King Cyrus of Persia, uh, you know, again, Persians were the ones that uh, conquered Judea and took the Jews into exile. King Cyrus of this country of Persia actually allows the Jews to return to their homeland. And this return uh, begins the post-exilic period. And as a result of this new start for the Israelites, being able to re return home, uh, there is a fresh perspective on the Jewish narrative, as well as a fresh outlook on the future that the writers felt was needed for the people. I mean, they've, they've been in exile. Now, some Jews thrived in exile. Some Jews... Uh, also didn't leave um, leave their exile. They liked where they were, right? They, they acclimated, right? And so not everyone wanted to go back. But for those that did, for those that did not like their exile, they needed a fresh outlook on the future. And the two books of Chronicles actually retell the Samuel and king's narratives but this retelling is it's a reboot it's an entire reboot it's in a new light it's a reinterpretation of those events that were previously told but a little bit more positively all the negative elements of the narrative of the narrative of those you know of samuel and kings have pretty much been removed from the story and there is a focus in Chronicles, on setting a positive tone for the future, moving beyond past sins and looking toward spiritual renewal as a, as a nation and as a people. And that is really the main takeaway from Chronicles. And there might be a lesson there this Lent and Easter, right? The lesson of letting go. Letting go of what weighs us down, letting go of what has had a negative effect on our life, and perhaps, maybe, reframing those life events, reframing those elements, but also seeking to move forward. Not necessarily denying that they happened, not allowing injustice to continue, but also at the same time, moving forward from those. Whether that has to do with family or friends or the church, to reframe and to move forward. Because eventually we all need to move on from past sins, from mistakes. Whether those were committed by us or inflicted on us. And to move past those and look toward spiritual renewal. So I hope you've enjoyed the past five weeks of the study of the Hebrew Bible. I know I have. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them my way. So thank you all and uh, take care.